Yeah, further travel adventures in the time of COVID. International travel adventures with Martin Despang. Good morning, Martin, 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 Martin. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. Good here in the evening, but early <laughs> evening, 12 hours <laughs> apart. Good to see you, Jay. Yeah, this is Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. Uh, it's a given Wednesday morning, a special show with Martin Despang. He's one of our regular hosts on Humane Architecture. In fact, uh, his his show is following this show, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And, <clears throat> but we thought we'd take a moment and discuss um, Martin's adventures because Martin actually is, um, he represents all of us uh, in many ways and uh, in, in, in certainly in connection with international travel where he's been trying to get uh, his international travel arrangements in order, but he's been running into some extraordinary obstacles uh, and getting back to Hawaii from Germany. Martin, can you talk about it? Yeah, and let's get some visuals up here that illustrate that pretty well. If you could get the first slide up here. In fact, we talked about this, Jay, about like uh, two months ago where I was in quarantine with my freshly wet wife on our second half of our honeymoon. And uh, we didn't know why we were in quarantine because we did the, you know, we thought we did the best to protect us, uh, not just personally, but us in Hawaii coming back. We got vaccinated, full vaccinated. We were PCR tested. Regardless, we ended up in quarantine. Mm -hmm. And so you helped me out with your great connections, uh, Jay, like this one here, all the way up to Lieutenant Governor Josh Green who gave it some thoughts, but his final recommendation was like, why don't you get yourself a booster shot? Because then you would be official here with your vaccination, you know? And we were rather hesitant at that because there's certain parameters, right? First of all, you need to be of that age or risk group, or you have to have that six month between your second shot and the booster. And none of them really did apply to me. So we didn't quite know. So we just had to live it through, live through this. And second slide, finally, here we are. We were free again, right? Here we are on uh, Cohio Avenue at our favorite uh, Paya Fish Marketplace, which uh, we've been talking about in human human architecture because they bring a different tropical exotic flair of some little bit more liberating way because they're run by people from Brazil. So this became our favorite spot. And they started to continue to be loyal because at some point we were in trouble again, although we were out of quarantine, all of a sudden the state law says, show your proof of evidence of vaccination, which they didn't accept to begin of, with because that put us in quarantine, right? So there we were again, potentially being kept out of all these delicious places that <laughs> we're supposed to leave our money to keep our economy running, right? So next slide. What they were kind enough to accept is that at the bottom right, which is my University of Hawaii Health Services, which you see me stopping by at the bottom left, which is bottom right, which DeSoto and I discovered as one of the great uh, easy breezy uh, tropical exotic buildings on campus that however should uh, open up a little bit more and get the breeze through, it's rather hermetic and they're not doing open heart surgery in there, right? So you could let some natural air in there, but there's a front desk. That lady there is privileged because she can catch the, the natural ventilation and she's in the shade there. So what uh, one of the, the employees there, a nurse, in fact, we talked about was able to do that she transcribed my German vaccination records into my University of Hawaii Health Services immunization records. That one I printed out and put in my wallet. And then can you imagine the poor uh, you know, person at the door of each restaurant, me unfolding that thing and trying to explain why that is equivalent to the CDC card they are very used to, right? So Paya was used to us, and then you, how you know what kind of aliens we were, and they were kind of fine with us. Then uh, I was planning to um, give our students the best intercultural, international, intercontinental, interclimatic. Uh, education and have me take them to the temperate zones 
And so preparing to fly back, I talked to my health uh, specialist doctor there. And, you know, at that point, we tried everything. So I didn't see another chance to basically follow Josh Green's recommendation and somehow find a way to, you know, manage the obstacles, obstacles within. But then my health center said, well, no, you're, you know, you're not eligible for the booster shot. That. So we seem to like, you know, run in circles and not go anywhere. Next slide. And the other piece of paper I had was from this lady of the Department of Health, who after, after looking at all our stuff, she, should, she said, you have more proof of evidence than most people I've seen. And her working in that institution means something. You know, being the architect always and forever, I just want to point out the building. Um, you know, there is uh, doctors, the medical realm, the physicians, right? You remember, Jay, there was this thing in the 70s that Jay called sick building syndrome where you know, some tempered hermetic brutalism was, um, was accused of making people sick. But in return, there should be, or the other way around, there should be something like the healthy building system. And this building here has it. This is a mid-century modern master building. We put the Google, although we just talked about Google, we have a little ambivalent feeling about Google these days after watching some Netflix series that you recommended to me. But here, using a Google picture in the north area, it shows us it's facing straight south with this Brie Soleil facade, has horizontal louvers to shade from the southern sun. And then when the sun comes around, it has the vertical ones. And I make this connection. I allow myself because you asked me the question last time, you know, how could we, you know, get people's mindsets shifted to? And I think this lady there who was so progressive to give me this sort of heads up is because she lives in a building that's healthy. So maybe her mindset was healthy because of that. <laughs> Let's give that some thought. Next slide. Before, before you leave the building, Martin, yeah, yeah. what, what about the um, aesthetic design of that building? It looks very institutional to me. Yeah, but, but you know, the point is it's not about the looks, it's about the feel. And that's what we try to tell the, the emerging generation. We're still stuck in postmodernism where we debate how buildings look. And we can only afford that. There's some unfortunate single wall unit AC machines in there that didn't used to be in there originally. And you know, if we turn AC off, if we don't let any oil tanker come anymore, we don't burn this to make electricity, we will love this building because we could actually survive in it with uh, natural ventilation versus in most buildings right over in downtown, you get baked or microwaved you know, or, you know, so, so this building, if we, if we switch our minds back to a, what used to be a pre-fossil now to a post-fossil scenario, we will find this building actually less institutionally stiff, but actually institutionally uh, legitimate and appropriate. Well, thank you for that. And, and furthermore, I think that that scenario may actually be coming soon. Yeah. And next slide. Um, so my, my way to get out of here with the hopes of coming back without getting quarantined again for wrapping up the semester was through more personal connections. The guy on the right is my German honorary consul, Dennis Sully, who happens to be from the town over of my hometown of Hanover, which is in the north of Germany. He's from Hamburg. And so uh, this is a, you know, he looks very sour because that, as you can tell from the people in the, this brings back the, um, in 2016, where there was a celebration of the uh, Democratic um, uh, mayor being reelected, but at the same time, the national president of the United States was elected. And that one, he was not amused. And I just put this smile on my face because of, you know, that's what you do when people take pictures of you. And then, um, you know, the guy at the very top left, the mural on that wall, local boy, Barack Obama, waved me through the morning after this tragic election with some 50 other uh, aliens, as they call us at that time. And Dennis was then, you know, foreseeing uh, the challenges that COVID would bring 
with it that we basically would be locked in the countries where we either are from or where we currently are. And he gave me, uh, the, the German language is complicated. We, we thought for a moment we would do this in German, right? But then we decided not to do. So what, what Dennis encouraged me and processed was the Beibehaltungsantrag, which is basically the uh, application for keeping my original native German citizenship besides my new American citizenship. So whenever I now go to the other country, I show the passport that they are familiar with, right? Not to confuse them. So um, uh, next slide. Um, Dennis happens to be married to an MD, and we were just at the Department of Health on Baratania. So just across the street is Queens Medical Center where she has her practice. And so he said, Martin, why don't you stop by the day or the morning before you leave, so we max it out. Uh, still, it's, it's only been four months. So I'm another prototype of I'm still alive and you know, I'm halfway able to speak. So boosters might actually work, uh, at least <laughs> kill you if you take them a little earlier. And then uh, he, she and her assistant actually, uh, thankfully then, she wanted to basically, rightly so, basically put in my CDC card, which then I finally got one. Wow, that was like Christmas and Easter together. <laughs> she wanted to put in basically what she had been performing, the booster shot, and her colleague basically said, wait a minute, that might keep this guy in trouble because then people might say, oh, he only had one shot. So they kindly, lucky me, also transcribed, like, like my university health center has done before, the first two shots in there. So now we're rather optimistic that I might actually, when I come back beginning of December to uh, be there for finals and wrapping up the semester, I might be able to basically bypass quarantine because I can show something uh, prior to departure that they are familiar with, a CDC card. Next slide. So this is me flying back. Uh, the, the plane from uh, Honolulu to uh, SFO was packed. There wasn't a single seat left, but the ones from uh, San Francisco to Munich was only half filled, as you can tell here. And um, again, I felt pretty safe because this yellow document that we talked about last time is the World Health Organization immunization pass that all these Europeans have, and I have one. So I thought I'm pretty good because I'm just returning to where I got my initial immunization. Uh, next slide. But uh, you wouldn't have invited me to the show if this would be boring, right? You want exciting adventure stories. So uh, this is all in German here, but I'm translating to you. I get from the Department of Health here in Munich they say, well, you've been coming back from a high risk area, which is the United States of America, and you haven't been uh, showing your proof of immunization. So we assume you have to quarantine. So here we go again. So this is balancing it out because, um, you know, we've been bitching quite a bit about our United States, but Germany isn't much better because, you know, day after day, we try to upload our documents. And in this case, shouldn't be strange to them, but the system somehow didn't take it. So next slide. Um, again, I'm, I'm not the one that we will welcome again uh, beginning uh, November 8th, which is all Europeans. You know, I was sneaking in early and sneaking out early and I'm not doing this for leisure. As I said before, we're in the process of setting up an exchange between the uh, university in Munich and in Honolulu. So I'm here uh, besides giving the students an international flair education, zooming them around here, everything that's different. I'm also talking to the university. Next slide. But um, again, uh, this is uh, Lufthansa, who is the uh, Star Alliance partner of my preferred carrier United, right? And they're sending out these emails here and saying, hey, you know, uh, welcome back. If you read this, it's kind of ironic. I think this must have been an intern who was like less experienced with, uh, with traveling and places. And they say basically, oh, um, 
Uh, are you up for beaches and exotic places? Why don't you go to Chicago and bicycle? And you're an early bicycle pioneer, if people didn't know yet. So, but it might be a little chilly to do that, you know, and the beaches <laughs> might be not that comfortable. <laughs> But never mind. So again, uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have been opening up. Thank you. But then at the bottom right, Aloha, we're open. So how is it about Hawaii, right? So next slide. We have to now be really, really fast. Uh, so it won't happen what we said in the last show. We were a little disappointed and grumpy that we said there are other places where it might be easier to travel to which is where we did the first half of our honeymoon, which some, as this uh, writer in the Hawaii Flux magazine calls Madeira, the Hawaii of Europe, right? So, so what do we do? And back to once to the built environment and its impact on our mindsets. Last, uh, next slide, second to last. This is actually the, uh, the, the US uh, um, um, Department of Health and, and Human Services and their building. And this is very about uh, international affairs. This is by the uh, modernist Marcel Breyer, who you were snapping away when Hitler was kicking them out. And he made this building that we can argue, you know, um, how institutional it looks like. But again, look at it from this performative lens, uh, Jay, that you say we will look this way pretty soon. And you see the windows are in the shade. So this building has a performative aspect keeps itself cool. So uh, what we're hoping now is that people working in this building and people working in our uh, Honolulu one that we've been looking at, that they're positively influenced by the, by the healthy way these, these buildings represent and they make smart decisions and act uh, a little different than in the past and basically do their homework familiarizing themselves with the different vaccines and, uh, you know, achieving compatibility and making it easy for people to travel. Because, you know, we don't want to forget for us, it's a 24 hour door to door. And this is the fastest connections with United. I always have a really uh, kind of tight, um, you know, stopover connection in San Francisco. Even with that one, it's 24 hours door to door. And it's in the range of 1500 to 2000 euros or dollars so right it, it takes a lot to do that so yeah we should get our acts together and and work on this fast because what is it today october 27th so november 8th that gives us less than two two weeks to improve so what what's going to happen to you on the way back can you sort of uh, show me show me the path and and any remaining obstacles you expect on whatever day in December you're coming back? I, I promised you, Jay, otherwise the show would be boring because now that I thought I got it all together, uh, they added another requirement, which is you don't only have to show um, proof of vaccination or full vaccination, but also that we go again, a test, a negative test. So I've actually been uh, on the phone with the German hotline of United Airlines that I always get the same nice lady on the phone. Her name is Mrs. Schneider. So hi, Mrs. Schneider. Always a pleasure to talk to you. And she's German, lives in Texas, has a 17-year-old son who has some preconditions. He got the booster. Now she was asking me, how did you get your booster? You know, And I, I said, come to Hawaii. Maybe I set you up with Dennis Sully's uh, you know, wife, and she can make a special business out of it. But um, I, I basically, more on a more serious note, I said, okay, are there any trusted testing partners, as they like to call it, that are set up? And she said, well, you know, coming to the U.S., um, I don't think so. You just have to have a PCR test or a, a quick test. Uh, but then again, that brings back memories because that's what we had. Like two months ago, we had one as we were pretty elaborative in the show. We had one from Eurofins. That's the top number one that even have a branch in the U.S. provider that they didn't know, didn't want to know. So hopefully now they will accept them, you know. So, yeah, that's the next obstacle. So it stays exciting and nerve wracking. <laughs> what about me? Suppose I wanted to hop on a plane, say, November 8th, I don't know, whatever day and uh, come and see you in, in uh, Munich. 
Um, what obstacles would I find? Well, first of all, I would look forward to. <laughs> That's most important. Same here. <laughs> and then I'm just going to hide you here, you know, and no one will, will know. <laughs> no, um, I, you know, again, with my, you have to upload the same thing as with me, because you have to upload your proof of evidence. Um, uh, but then again, the system I don't have any to, European documentation. No, you, you don't. You don't. Yeah. But the system then has to basically accept your your sort of exotic documentation, right? And, and that's the point. We just got to, on both sides, you know, we got to reopen, uh, not just physically, but also uh, mentally, right? <laughs> and just just, again... They basically say, you know, online, they say again, okay, if it is um, something that both Americans and Germans know or even have developed together, like Pfizer, which is a German-American collaboration to begin with, and the first vaccination that was around, they're going to be more, you know, uh, they're going to be more, more open to it, right? Don't come with, with Sputnik or something like that. You know? uh, no, don't People do be that. suspicious. Yeah. So, you know, the question, I suppose, is whether this is something I can research in advance on my computer at home and then be reasonably confident I met all the requirements when I, when I uh, you know, uh, amble off to the airport. Or, or is it something where I can expect surprises, uh, where I'm, I'm going to have to take, um, you know, uh, clever methods and clever steps to to complete the trip. What's your thought on that? Yeah, I mean, we, we reached a point, you know, we've been talking about the, the what's it called, the billion dollar code uh, Netflix series. That's the one we're talking about. I'm talking about general magic, which shows us kind of the dark sides, you know, of technology. And so here, I, the, the biggest trap is basically technology. All these softwares that you know, they had to scramble to get together to work and they're not bulletproof. And so I, I think, again, if they would just use common sense and really do a quick training, you know, for their personnel and just have, you know, the specifications of the vaccinations here and there, put them side by side. As we said, this is no rocket science. I mean, it's, it's all, so just train qualified personnel <laughs> And put them at the airport, you know, then you don't risk your supposedly smart software is just failing on you, you know, which is which is what we went through. It was basically, or it was people hiding behind the softwares. I'm not, you know, sure, or both. Yeah. But um, I don't know how long you want to, you probably want to stay. Well, we have human human architecture next, so we don't, you know, we're not, I don't know how much you want to stretch out a show time. Well, I may want to stay a long time, depending on what happens in the next yeah. elections. <laughs> go, go to the go to the next slide because I don't want to have missed out on talking about this one here. This is familiar to you. You've been on the review of one of our inventions, which is called Primitiva Three, and it's basically based on the um, on the awareness that you know going back to business as it used to be before COVID is no option. Uh, and it shouldn't be an option because COVID just pointed out things that we just didn't want to see, all the things that were, you know, full of flaws and, and errors, and especially our economy based on solely or majorly tourism and then secondly, military needed an, an overhaul. But as long as it worked, you know, as long as it was profitable, that's just the, the, the problem in capitalism. It's not changing unless it's profitable for it, right? But COVID has shown how vulnerable and how fragile that is. And um, so what the primitivas try to do is basically set sort of a beacon sign of a different mindset of saying we're going to fully embrace our unique selling proposition of a unique climate in Hawaii. And we, we built, um, uh, you know, environments that are unlike anywhere else in the world. And we first of all, build it for ourselves again, for everyone in need and the increasingly many on the island, everyone out on the streets and out of work and struggling to make a living. 
we want to basically, without being sentimental or romantic about it or nostalgic, but realistically saying we have been able for the longest time in Hawaii, we were self-sustained and self-sufficient. And there were living as many people on the islands as there are now. And they were all doing it without any help or things from outside. So what these things are aiming for is do this again. And once we reach this, it will be paradise again. And all of a sudden, the tourists that we needed so desperately, we have this love and hate relationship with, right? Because it, it, it's based upon dependency and dependency is never good. Just imagine you wouldn't fight for oil anymore in the world. You could just be friends with the Arabs, right? You could be friends with everyone and you can argue without suppressing each other. So that's kind of the dream to say what well, we're then reopening, basically we, you know, what Kili, I will never forget uh, one of your friends and my friend and longest holds Kali Akina, when he was saying, you know, Martin, my, my culture is by nature welcoming, you know, very welcoming. And we don't care where you guys are from. As long as you behave and mean well, you're one of us, no matter where you come from, where your blood is from or whatever. So then we can invite people and we say, but it's conditional that you can't just deplete or abuse this here and, and do things that you wouldn't do at home. I just had my, you know, as one of my little surprise things for when I was back on the island, I had the main sewage pipe been clogged and all of a sudden filthy, smelly black water was rising up in my, in my bathtub. And the plumber basically said, well, someone threw diapers or whatever, into the into the pipe, you know, and would would someone living there permanently do it? I doubt it, right? So we don't want to be hostile against tourists, but it's likely to say, you know, they just thought, who cares? I'm here for that little time. It won't it won't bother me. So we need to get back to this to this mindset of like, okay, I I this is the most beautiful place on earth. I'm privileged to be here as a temporary resident, and that's why I will behave like that. So I, think I wonder if that, you know, if uh, I wonder if that would be everywhere, but that's that's basic inconsiderate um, is what it is, no matter how you cut it. But what, what about other places for Primitiva? Um, you know, you you mentioned that it's perfect for Hawaii, but what about other? what about Munich? Could you do? Would you do? Uh, is there a possibility that you can do uh, projects like Primitiva in, in Munich or other European cities? Well, absolutely. And in fact, you remember, and we, we refer to, um, we have a show quote there in the water there. That's just the one show that was the presentation show. But then we had two Q&A shows after that. And in these, uh, you guys, when you will revisit them, you will see that it actually comes from Munich because it's based on the um, philosophy of Fry Otto. And his mother called him Fry because they, she wanted him to be a free spirit because that's- I remember Fry. this. I remember this. Yes, right? yes, yes. And so he, in fact, uh, was struggling because he was Mr. Do the most with the least with tensile systems. That's how Tarzan and Jane basically move most elegantly through the jungle, right? Not with elephant legs that trample <laughs> everything down. I'm talking these massive uh, buildings in Kaka'ako. They're elephants, right? We want them to basically like monkeys and Tarzan and Jane basically, you know, swing through the jungle. And that's why tensile system is perfect for that one. And he did. He did with a 67 Montreal Pavilion, the German one. Um, that our mentor Larry Medlin was collaborating. And then here in Munich, the 72 Olympics, right? And then he was doing in Berlin a case because his heart was also as an ecologist, not just as he sort of get, was getting tired. They said, they call me the tent guy, but I'm more. I'm the green guy as well. So he made this in the Tiergarten in Germany. He made this eco village. And in this eco village, you can see the struggle that he wanted it to be. I, we think the perfect, and this is sort of a posthume homage or, you know, to him that he should have been in Hawaii. He could have accomplished it. But here it's already below freezing and it, the temperatures will get low and lower low. So you need to make that puffy coat threshold between you and the environment. So um, you need a lot more effort. So yes, you can do them but they're gonna be way more complicated. They're gonna be way more costly. 
So the best way to prototype this, to showcase that is guess where? With us in Hawaii. Uh, Martin, before we run out of time, I just want to ask you a couple of things about the future. You know, you've been um, examining this issue of uh, international travel, the obstacles in COVID. And we know, you. in fact, you mentioned that COVID has profoundly changed the world. And those changes are, are not, um, you know, necessarily reversible. We, we may find that our world has changed, at least in some ways, permanently. And so my question to you is uh, international travel. Uh, from your observation of it, your experience with it, um, is it changed forever and how? Well, again, let's we're, we're towards the end sort of a concluding. So let's take a, a positive and optimistic angle. Um, it, it, it has changed. It will have changed forever. I mean, I, I was privileged to when I returned to the U.S. to coach, to start my coaching career, they made a plane for me that was the Airbus uh, 380, one of the most comfortable airplanes. I used to have terrible uh, ear pressure problems, not in the 380 anymore. So it was just beautiful, but it, uh, they're all out commissioned now because they're not efficient and effective enough anymore. They were too big and they were too uh, kerosene consumptive um, for so. But it's ironic because they've only been around for you know a little more than a decade, and they're all basically now disposed. I mean, just think about it's 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 like surreal, right? But uh, they have uh, instead bought uh, a fleet of thirty or something supersonic jets, and this is something into the future. You know, they're more economic. They use less fuel. They're faster. They're supposedly more comfortable. So, you know, and there's in one of the shows we've been technology, by the way, is there to run uh, airplanes with algae, which guess where could we produce algae the best in the tropics, right? Where it's always warm and humid and the sun is always out there. So how about we basically cash crop uh, algae kerosene on the island and, and fuel our airplanes with that? So there's lots of really good stuff and promising stuff out there. Um, so I'm, I'm optimistic, uh, but again, this is sort of a midterm or, or long-term range. Yeah, right. I, I, I certainly agree. You have, to, you have to look into the future. And my, my final question is when and uh, under what conditions do you think that um, the international air travel experience will return to some degree of normalcy? What will it take? And when will it happen? I, you know, everyone is optimistically talking about reopening. My provost, Michael Bruno, who you had on the show a couple of times, you know, been repeatedly spreading optimism. And I just got this email we all got as of this morning as UH employees of, you know, most optimistic about the spring. And, um, and, and the airlines are sort of massively, massively reopening, of course, because of countries and culture are, are, are opening up. So I, I believe, and I'm, I'm personally, because of the students most interested, because of the exchange uh, that we try to put together, and there's some resistance to sort of virtual exchanges, uh, which I sort of understand as well. So nothing beats the real deal, right? So you really want to have seen... Uh, you know, snow, you can look at and say, oh, it's white, and you're rather dressed, you know, warmly, but nothing beats to make a snowball, right? So we, you know, nothing beats the real deal. So I'm probably, you know, sort of in a biased way, optimistic that uh, by next fall, hopefully we have uh, reached a point where we are uh, sort of as much as we can be back to to normal. Well, there you have it. There you have it. And I hope you wrote that down because uh, these issues will be on the final exam. Uh, it's a subjective exam. It's coming soon. Uh, Martin Despang, Professor Martin Despang, UH School of Architecture and host of our Humane Architecture program coming soon in half an hour. Thank you so much, Martin. Thank you, Jay. Aloha. Bye.